Hello ladies and gentlemen, thank you so much for clicking onto this video today. UNLV Nesby's interview with President Keith Whitfield is coming right up, but first we're going to have a reading of President Keith Whitfield's biography. You can find time codes to this video right below in the video description. Uh, thank you so much. Please stick around. I'm sure you'll enjoy. Thank you so much for sticking around. I'm going to read President Keith E. Whitfield's biography, which can also be found on UNLV's website, unlv.edu. Keith E. Whitfield is a seasoned university administrator and prolific scholar in the fields of psychology, health, and aging. He became UNLV's 11th president on August 24, 2020. Whitfield previously served as provost, senior vice president of academic affairs, and professor of psychology at Wayne State University in Michigan. There, he was responsible for faculty hiring, promotion and tenure, and budget policies for faculty and staff. He also oversaw student affairs, including student success, curriculum, and housing. Under his leadership, the university achieved remarkable gains in its graduation rate, increased overall enrollment, launched an innovation and entrepreneurship hub, and strengthened multiple business and philanthropic relationships. An active administrator and researcher, Whitfield has authored or co-authored over 200 publications and has earned nearly $20 million in funding from agencies including the National Institutes of Health, the National Institute on Aging, and the National Science Foundation. A psychologist and expert on the social, psychological, and cultural factors of cognition and healthy aging, Whitfield's current research focuses on the relationship between stress and longevity in African American families. He's a member of the NIA's National Advisory Council on Aging, and he has served on committees for the National Academies of Science and Medicine and the National Institute of Health. Prior to Wayne State, Whitfield served as Vice Provost for Academic Affairs at Duke University and held appointments as a professor in the Department of Psychology and Neuroscience, a research professor in the Department of Geriatric Medicine at Duke University Medical Center, and a senior fellow at the, Re excuse me, at the Center for the Study of Aging and Human Development. He also was the co-director of the Center on Biobehavioral Health Disparities Research. Whitfield is the first African-American president in UNLV's history and oversees a university with more than 31,000 students and 4,000 full-time employees. He has worked in higher education for more than three decades and has received numerous national awards and honors throughout his career. He earned a bachelor's degree in psychology from the College of Santa Fe, a PhD in Lifespan Developmental Psychology from Texas Tech University and completed postdoctoral training in quantitative genetics from the University of Colorado Boulder. Thank you for sticking around. Up next is UNLV Nesby's interview with President Keith E. Whitfield. Stay tuned. Hello ladies and gentlemen, my name is Paul Jacob Barney. I'm the current president of UNLV Nesby. I am joined today by UNLV President Dr. Keith Whitfield. Uh, first, let me say thank you for allowing me to interview you um, because obviously your schedule is always full. Um, it is my pleasure and honor to spend this time with you. Okay. All right. Very good to be here, Paul. Thank you very much. Thank you, sir. Uh, so, Mr. President, would you like for me to introduce the NSB organization now or later in the interview? Why don't we do it now? Excellent, sir. So, NSBE stands for the National Society of Black Engineers, and NSBE is one of the largest student-governed organizations based in the United States. NSBE, founded in 1975, supports and promotes the aspirations of collegiate and pre-collegiate students and technical professionals in engineering and technology. With more than 600 chapters and more than 24,000 active members in the U.S. and abroad, Nesby's mission is to increase the number of culturally responsible black engineers who excel academically, succeed professionally, and positively impact the community. Here's a little bit about UNLV Nesby. UNLV's chapter of the National Society of Black Engineers, also called UNLV Nesby, is a student organization established in the UNLV Howard Hughes College of Engineering 
more than 30 years ago today by the first director of the UNLV Minority Engineering Program, Dr. Eugene McGaw, and the first president of UNLV NSB, Mr. Dave Dragon. Today, each semester, UNLV NSB holds general body meetings and workshops, provides resources and scholarship and job opportunities to its general body, and participates in NSB corporate and UNLV events, as well as strives to create an interconnected community of students. Finally, UNLV NSB is under the Multicultural Program for STEM and Health Sciences. The UNLV Minority Engineering Program is now called the UNLV Multicultural Program for STEM and Health Sciences and is directed by Dr. Joanna Jazerska. UNLV is one of five affinity organizations within the College of Engineering under the Multicultural Program and is advised by Dr. Joanna Jazerska. Dr. Jazerska advises UNLV's chapters of the Society of Women Engineers, the Society of Asian Scientists and Engineers, the Society of Hispanic Professional Engineers, and the American Indian Science and Engineering Society. On behalf of UNLV and SB, the Multicultural Program, and its affinity organizations in the UNLV Howard Hughes College of Engineering, I welcome you to the UNLV campus. Thank you very much. It's great to be here. Excellent, sir. Okay. So after um, the upcoming interview questions, of which, of which there are maybe five or six, I will give you an opportunity to ask any questions you may have of UNLV and SB, the Multicultural Program, or me. So may I begin with the question, sir? Yes, please. Very well. The first question is, was the UNLV Presidential Cabinet your selection, or were you added to the team? Please tell us about the high-performing team that you've put together and what the most important principles are that you follow in governing and leading your team. Um, so I'm, I, I take it that you're talking about my team that we have here at UNLV. I've, I've put together a few teams in the past, and I think I follow a pretty simple set of uh, principles, and that is, is that, um, you know, <laughs> it's kind of like if you're in a leadership position, you got to lead. You don't manage. You don't just take and, and, and make sure that all the T's are crossed and the I's are dotted. That has to be done, but there has to be some aspiration. There has to be interaction and collegiality. And that's something that um, I have both been able to inherit uh, as well as identify some new talent uh, that uh, exists at the university, as well as pulling some talent from outside the university. So I've got a little bit of all of those three different forms that have taken uh, shape in terms of the leadership team that we currently have in place. Um, one of my first hires was Ricky McCurry, um, who came to us from Northern Arizona. And it was really his thinking about how you form teams for a unit that was growing and changing and evolving and that it, he was gonna be the perfect person for there. Um, some other changes that I made, one in particular was uh, economic development. And, you know, if this had been another point in history, I may not have made that change, but I knew that for our state and for our recovery on the other side of COVID, whenever we were really on the other side, it was that we as a university needed to contribute to developing ec the economics that are in our region and to be a partner with everything going on around us. And so I elevated that position from being kind of a couple of steps down to that it directly reported to me so I could partner with that person and be able to achieve some goals that actually have the university helping to develop economic diversity that ultimately it's that our students are contributing to it. So we've got to have a plan. We've got to have a way going forward to doing that. So um, that's that's the team that we put together and I'm, I'm very happy with them so far. That's excellent, sir. Thank you for your response. So my second question is, what is your definition of leadership? What is your overarching purpose as a leader? Um, so my definition of leadership, um, it's very interesting. In some ways it is informed by my father when I, you know, you're asking some hard hitting questions here and you're making me really think. But as I think about leadership, um, I think about a certain kind of leadership, which is servant leadership. It's the idea that um, you get into leadership not for the, you know, prestige or the influence you can do or whatever, but it's more for serving for a purpose. Uh, my father was in the military, was in the military for 30 years. And 
he really did bring home, I think, in lots of things that he said and did, of the idea that he was serving his country and that there was a greater purpose. It wasn't just for some micro thing. It was really for um, the safety and for uh, our country being able to, to be great in the way that it needed to be great and that everybody played a role. And I think of the same thing of that, you know, my job as a leader, um, actually this is, you're making me really think here, Paul, because I have found it fascinating that I think some people sometimes are a little surprised that, you know, if something needed to be taken to the copier and copied, I will get up and do it. And that's because I'm a servant leader, you know, it's for that purpose and that there's no job that's too small. So you make sure that anything and everything that needs to be done and that even your purpose in terms of what your goals are, are goals that you see truly through the eyes of the institution or the organization that you serve to be able to try to make it better. And you use both your talents, but you use the talents of people around you to be able to move that forward. And that as a leader is what the job is, what that's what the task is, and that's what the challenge is oftentimes too. Yes, sir. Wow. That's excellent, sir. Um, so I, my next question is, uh, what advice would you give to students aspiring to become the type of leader that you describe? Um, my big thing, it's so funny because uh, I, I think about your question um, relative to what I've even mentored students. I, I've done a lot of mentoring over the course of my career and, and actually take a lot of pride uh, that I've been able to contribute to the development of people. But when they get to that point of being leaders, um, it's funny, it's the same thing that's a basic principle, which is, is that uh, I'm a big one about follow what your passion is. Um, that, it's so funny, you have to make sure that it doesn't get out of control, but it's that your passion tries to help drive the energy that you need to be that servant leader, to be working for others, because it's usually got some big challenge to it. So if you're not, you know, dedicated to it and sticking with it and moving forward, it's, it's hard to do. So, for example, for me, um, one of my passions is student success. Um, there is nothing greater than being able to see students cross that stage and get that degree. And it's like there's all of these pieces that go on to getting to that moment in time. And so then I'm very passionate about figuring out as institutions, how do we use both our economic resources and our people resources to be able to get students and to provide students those opportunities that will get them to that moment in time. So when I talk to other people, it's like, don't do something because you think it's the popular thing. Don't do something because at the moment, that's the, the thing that people say that's needed. Do the things that you're passionate about. You don't even have to be good at them because you can develop skills. And I think that's what I've had to do on a lot of things. But that basic passion, and one of them is uh, for student success, is something that then drives me to do that service and it's more rewarding in some ways too because you do get to be happy yourself and you're doing something that's going to be good for others yes sir well i have more questions about that student success later on in the interview um, and uh, here's my next question as undergraduate students in stem each semester unlv and sb seeks out and is offered internship opportunities from the Las Vegas community and the greater West U.S. for the purpose of learning, of learning um, technical skills. Does UNLV have any semester-long or year-long internship opportunities for College of Engineering, multicultural, and minority students to learn leadership skills under the office of the President or Provost Office? Well, I would say that, you know, most of those internship skills um, one of those inter internships opportunities come from the college and the president and the provost office actually support uh, and try to help develop and cultivate relationships that then the, the dean's uh, office in the colleges can do. So there's none directly. Um, we have started some leadership opportunities for faculty and staff because we want them to be servant leaders and so we've started a recent program for them. But I think down to this point of talking about internships for students which Please, if you get an opportunity, do an internship. They mean so much. They are very, very important. And they're very important in the world that we live in today. Um, I can tell you from some of my previous experiences, some of which have been with some big tech companies, um, listening to them articulate who ends up, one, who they predict will be successful, two, who they actually seek out for job opportunities, those are ones who have done an internship. 
And now sometimes it, it's not even have to be with them. They want to see that a person has taken the kind of academic knowledge that they've had and put it to practical use. So internships are very, very important. I can tell you I had, <laughs> I had a breakfast yesterday morning uh, at about 6.30 and the whole purpose for me being there was that I was talking to a group of you know incredible business people, the Las Vegas Economic Association, uh, and talking to a bunch of people. And one of the things that I talked about was internships for students. If you know of internships for students, reach out to me, and I'll put you in contact with the people that need to have them, because I, I just am a huge fan. I think they're critically important. And, and I think particularly for students in STEM fields, um, that, that taking that practical uh, uh, activity and, and knowledge uh, on with the academic knowledge that you learn, that's that's like this one-two punch that is going to be able to make you successful and very, very competitive out on the job market. So, none directly, but um, it's one of the things that we do, myself and the provost, we actually interact with the community as much as possible um, and try to find more and more opportunities for our students. Um, and because it's becoming a more popular issue for businesses to have interns, I'm hoping that we can generate more and more opportunities for, for students like you. Well, thank you so much, sir. Um, and I'm glad you mentioned the how, how essential um, internships are for STEM students. Um, UNLV, Nesby, we, as I said, we offer internships um, and we are offered internships from the community in the greater uh, West US. And we're so thankful um, to everyone who reaches out to our organization um, because Experience, as you said, is so important, um, and these are the things that employers look at when looking to hire students. Um, so thank you for mentioning that, sir. I will continue into my third question. Uh, you were recently interviewed by the Las Vegas Black Image magazine. I read your interview titled, Diversity Means Everybody. And uh, my question is, when asked, oh, this is from the um, interview, when asked what you wanted to bring to the administrative table as the new UNLV president, you said in part, UNLV needs a student success champion as a president. You added, my big thing is about student success. Then when you were asked about your legacy at UNLV, you said, we are going to get student success rate up from the current 44% to at least 60% success. Okay, now I have like three sub questions about that set of quotes. Uh, please tell us what does student success mean to the administration? Uh, can you identify the metric by which student success is being measured? And what does your plan look like for the fulfillment of your 44 to 60% success vision? Uh, great interconnected questions, Paul. Thank you. And um, so what I'd say, first off, what does student success mean? Um, it's funny because we do use metrics. I mean, we use it because that helps us to, to plot the things that we're doing, whether that is actually having the effect that we want, which is, is to grow the number of students being able to graduate. So we look at six-year graduation rates, and currently it's at 44%. Um, I, I do believe that we bring in, you know, some of the most smart and talented students uh, that are out there and that um, if we can do the things that are needed to be done, we can get it to 60%. So we track that pretty closely. I mean, that's a number that we look at basically, um, you know, at the beginning of the semester, in the middle of the semester, at the end of, of every semester, we, we start taking a look and looking at the graduation uh, that we're having of students and who's coming through the pipeline. Uh, because some of our programming actually may be different for uh, for a junior than it would be for a freshman. And so um, there are tons of efforts. I've been very, very impressed with the dedication and commitment that people have towards student success. Student success doesn't just happen. Yeah, it, it's the reason why you were talking about my comment about uh, making sure that there was a, a student success president. It's not that previous presidents weren't student success presidents, um, but it is kind of a, more of a focus I think for uh, many presidents today, because it is something realizing that while getting an education, you know, helps to provide all of these different, you know, facets to your life and well-rounded and, and thoughts, whatever, the, the job has to be that doing all of those things leads to getting that degree. Uh, we have a lot of people in this country who have some college, but no degree. And 
that just that just kills me that they you know they've started down this road and something happened and they weren't able to finish their degree so you know to some degree that's the metric and um, in terms of the kinds of things that need to be done it's it's looking at that and saying well why do people not finish their degree what do they need what happened to them and I think you know in people's lives things happen and things change but there should never be something that a university is the thing that limits somebody from getting that degree. If they want to get that degree, they're working hard towards it. We need to try to make sure that we make every effort to make it so that people can get to that degree. And so that's the commitment that gets done. I think in terms of my plan of what it looks like, um, it, there's there's a couple of different facets to it. I know, uh, you know we've only got so much time today, so <laughs> I won't do my usual and go on and on and on about it because I'm I'm... I, I love talking about the different facets of how you develop student success within uh, a university. You know, part of it is as a culture of having, making sure that everybody understands, every faculty member, every staff person, and even your fellow students actually understand that they contribute to student success. So that's one thing. It's kind of a culture that you want to develop. The second thing is, is to make sure that we use technology to our best ability. Um, there's nothing better than to be reminded of some of the things that you need to do to get over the hurdles and the paperwork and all those things that you need to do as you progress through your college career. Um, and also make sure that we're connecting with you and providing you as much information as you all need. You all live in this incredibly information overload society. So we've got to figure out how do we make sure we get you all of the things that are critically important. So as you're making that pathway to that, that degree, that you have the information that you need. So that's another one. And then lastly, it's trying to make sure that we figure out um, what are the most important things and when people need them to be able to make it there. So for example, when you're first starting off your first couple of years, hopefully you're doing your uh, general education requirements. Okay, so is there anything that's a barrier? For some people it's math. I know there was for me, um, you know, so what can we do? What kind of programming, what kind of support do we need to do? And I'm telling you, it's, it's so deep we could have a whole conversation about even just math alone, of trying to get people to remove the stigma and be able to understand that people can be good at math. And so it's, I mean, there's a whole science to that now that we're trying to do that we're then importing and using those best lessons, those best practices for how we provide an, an education and opportunity for students here at UNLV. So, um, you know, that's what it looks like. It's going to be ever evolving. It's going to be one where we have our focus to it. We change the culture of it. We provide the resources and, 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 and you know, support structures for it. Actually, this fall, we're going to have a student success summit. And it's in part to say everybody's a part of this. What are we doing right? And then where are the opportunities where we can do more? So those are some pieces for how that plan actually looks. But it'll continue to evolve because the more we learn, the better we can be. Thank you so much, sir, for your robust answer. Um, I'm sure many students will be happy to hear all that you said and satisfied with what you said. So my fourth question comes from a, um, an officer of UNLV Nesby. UNLV NSB Academic Excellence Chair and Patent Filer, Thuan Chin, also read your interview in the Black Image Magazine. He took interest in the following quote where you say, One of the things that makes me slightly different is that I'm still a researcher. I am heavy into African American families and longevity. Everything that I do connects me with students and families for everyone. Thuan Chin would like to know what is the current topic of your research and a little bit about your findings. Okay, so you got to remember, uh, at my heart, I'm still a, a, a faculty member and a professor, and so I am going to do my best not to give you a lecture, <laughs> but is to say that, uh, yes, I actually am still an active researcher. I have uh, uh, a study that's being completed down in North Carolina that's looking at longevity within families. And what's kind of fun for me is that this was something that probably came after from 10 years of doing other work and it's evolved to this next set of questions, which is what are the things that actually take African-Americans out in terms of their health? And is there some familial component or a pattern that we find within families that we can understand that and maybe in the future even intervene? And the primary focus of it is looking at stress and health. 
Um, stress is a great contributor, a significant contributor to chronic disease. And African Americans have shorter life expectancies in large part because of chronic disease. And so kind of tying the two together and saying, you know, is this something that we learn? Because stress is a perception. So is this something that we learn? And if we learned it, we probably learned it within families. Or, and we learned it within families, not necessarily from our parents, but it might have been from our parents. Or it might have been that, you know, we're, and I'm, putting, I'm holding up my fingers because we're looking at, we compare siblings to families that don't have the parents having lived, that they, um, their mortality happened earlier. And then siblings who their parent actually is still living. So we have then their parents who are, you know, 80s and 90s and then looking at siblings. And so we compare how similar are all of our siblings. We look at how si similar are our siblings in these two different kinds of families. And then we look at how close are our siblings and our parents uh, in, in our study. So um, I, I saw you make a face and boy, I, 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 someday maybe you can, you'll let me just give you a lecture about our study right. because it is interesting to think about. It's a way in which we can try to improve health by understanding more about what those interrelationships are. And so that's the focus of much of it. Um, I have papers still that are coming from lots of other things. And I'll make this point because I was making it to somebody earlier. I think it's important. It's, it's what I expect out of my, my cabinet, as you were asking about that. And that is, is about collaboration of that. You know, no, one's a, no one needs to be a silo. And so in my research, I made sure that I wasn't a silo. I actually interconnected and connected with lots of other researchers. And so now, in the later parts of my career where I don't have a lot of time because I kind of got this other day job called being a president. Um, it's great because they take and use some of my research that some of the data that I'd not asked the kind of question that they're interested in and they use it to answer other questions. They have me join and I can write and it's, it's far easier to edit a paper than it is to write a paper. Mm -hmm. So I get to do that and I get to still be a part of the research process and, and thinking about things. That's the kind of stuff, uh, that I, maybe I get to do on the weekends, you know, uh, taking care and, and participating and trying to lead this great university is what uh, what takes up most of my time. But in those other times, that's what I spend my time doing. That's a very exciting uh, hobby, if you will. And I'm very I'm, interested in your research myself as a young um, African-American man. And my dad, he's actually 73 years old um, this year. So I'm very interested in your research and I hope I can one day uh, learn more. So, just make sure the longer that your parents live, yes, sir. It's, not the, it's not a direct relationship, but the longer they live, it's usually the longer that the children live. There, there is longevity within families. Mm. So my mom, my mom is, uh, well, hopefully she won't see this, but I'll tell her, hey, she's 82. And uh, I always say, you know, hey, you just keep going because the longer you get to go, usually that it may help the prediction of how long I'll get to go. Mm -hmm. So. Well, sir, that concludes um, my questions for you. Uh, I want to thank you sincerely on behalf of um, the members and advisors of your time and in your office uh, that helped put this together. And uh, this has truly been an honor and a pleasure. Thank you again. Uh, are there any questions that you have for me in like this last two minutes? I could try well, to the answer. question I have for you is what year are you in school? I am, uh, I have enough credits to be a junior. But this is my, okay. I'm going into my third year um, okay. in the fall. Very good. I want to make sure I'm, I'm in my mind trying to plant the idea that uh, uh, which graduation I'm going to see you coming across the stage. So uh, I, I will expect that to be here in the next year or so. Very well, sir. All right. Well, uh, if you have no further questions, this will conclude the interview. I don't have any. Thank you very much for having me. Um, you know, the, the STEM fields, they're so very important to our world and our country. And there's so many great things that you can do uh, with that kind of background. And I hope that uh, all of you all get to pursue what your passions are and make sure that uh, you remember uh, w where you came from, which is going to be UNLV, and that we launched you on some of those great careers. So thank you very much for your time. Good luck. Thank you, sir. You take care. God bless. All righty. Bye-bye. Bye-bye. Thank you so much for watching our YouTube video. If you'd like to learn more information about President Keith E. Whitfield, UNLV Nesby, or the Multicultural Program for STEM and Health Sciences, there will be more information in the video description below. We would like to send a special thanks to President Keith E. Whitfield and his presidential office for making this interview and video possible. We thank you for your time, 
Thank you for your knowledge, and we thank you for your listening ears. We hope you have a nice day. Take care. God bless.